Hi there, and welcome to How to Write Science Fiction That Doesn't Suck. I'm Rick Partlow, and today I want to get into um, advice. Bad advice, good advice, the advice you let yourself take when it comes to writing. Now, if you found this YouTube channel, then you know that there are so many YouTube channels about how to write, how to write a novel, how to market a novel podcast, uh, there's courses you can take, there's nonfiction books you can read, there are conventions you can go to, and all of them have one thing in common, they're full of advice. You know, um, I have listened to a lot of it. I mean, it took me a while to get to the point where I even knew it was out there, but when I did, I started listening to it all, hoping that among all that advice would be nuggets of wisdom that could help my career to take off and get to the next level. Um, and as someone who has written 53 novels, who has made a living from writing, who uh, has been you know, nominated for awards, has, has been successful at this game, I feel like I have a little bit of a handle on whose advice I think I should take. And I want to try to help you because you're here for advice. Um, and the first thing I want to tell you is you cannot take the advice I give verbatim and put it into practice and be sure that your books are going to be successful or well-written because advice comes from subjective viewpoints. I used to be heavily into uh, shooting, you know, uh, defensive shooting drills and things like that and competitions. And there was a lot, it, it's, it's, it's similar to the writing game in that there is just so much advice out there. And the way it's similar even more is that you get people who have survived gunfights, who have survived, who've been in combat, or been a police officer who survived gunfights, and they take the fact that they survived that gunfight and prevailed, and they assume that means that the advice they're giving you is the only way you can survive a gunfight. Or they even, even less than that, if they're a little more humble, they assume that this advice will work for you to survive a gunfight. There may be other ways you can do it, but they know this works, so they're going to teach it to you. There's only one problem with that. There's so many, just like writing and publishing and marketing a successful book, there are so many variables that go into surviving a gunfight that you can't be sure that how you trained or the stance you used, or the caliber you used, or the shot placement. You can't be sure any of those was really relevant. It might have been plain luck. Because in a just not to go out too far off the deep end, but if if you're if you're a cop facing a criminal and you shoot him and he goes down, does that mean you shot him in the exactly the right place? Or does it mean that he was predisposed to think I've been shot, now I need to go down because he's seen it so many times. You have no way of knowing. He might have, if you if you shot someone and they didn't go down, was that guy drunk? Was he high? Was it, Were his pain centers deadened? Was he more immune to shock than somebody else? So it's it's very dangerous in, in the uh, defensive shooting re realm to assume that because someone survived doing this, that you will survive doing this. And it's very dangerous in the writing realm, realm, I say that three times fast, to assume that because someone was successful using this style of writing or this style of marketing, that you will be successful. Because the odds are it's going to be slightly different for you, at least slightly different. Uh, and a lot of people who had success with similar methods 
in a certain time period will assume that that still works because they're still successful. But in reality, they've gained their they gained their market when those tactics were successful, and now they are making money because they have a mar they have an audience, and they think it's because oh I'm still putting out my newsletter or I'm still you know uh, doing Facebook ads or I'm still on Book Talk, but it it really is more I have people who found my books and want to read them. So that's the same type of uh, situation you have in the writing game, and it's not just in uh, marketing. It's in writing as well. In the writing advice you get, craft advice you get as well. Um, if I was giving you craft advice thirty years ago, maybe it'd be totally different than it is now, because styles change, and you don't know that the style you're writing in is going to be unsuccessful. Um, let me give you an example of craft advice that people get and they assume it's gospel. Uh, Stephen King and a bunch of other people, including me, don't like overusing adverbs. I, I, you know, Some people don't like using them at all. But you can't say if you overuse adverbs, your book's not going to be successful or it's not going to be well-reviewed because I was just rereading the first book in the Wheel of Time. It's chock full of overuse of adverbs. I mean, it's especially egregious when I'm listening to the audiobook and you can hear Lee, Lee, Lee at the end of like every third word. He chopped, he chopped the tree mightily. You know, something like that. It's just like one adverb after another. And yet, it's the most successful fantasy series for of its day. You know, the of that time period in the 90s. And it didn't matter because it's a good story. So, let's talk about who gives advice. Now... There are different levels of advice you can get and take. I, I do this YouTube channel. It's a hobby. It's a way to give back. Uh, I don't monetize it. I don't get any money from this at all. Um, I've considered setting up like a Patreon, but I really just don't have time for that because I'm writing. And that's the thing. A lot of the advice you get is from people who make their living or a good part of their living writing nonfiction, teaching nonfiction courses, uh, making nonfiction videos, how to videos that are monetized. And they do this sometimes because they were very successful and everybody asked them for advice, but sometimes it's not. I mean, for, for, there's one who's very successful, Mark Dawson. Incredibly successful indie thriller writer. Uh, and he, I mean, he didn't have to go to nonfiction to make money. He, But he did, and he made lots of money at it. And I can't say that that's bad, because he was a very successful writer before he started this. He uh, he made a lot of money. He, he, is very, he had, I think, I believe one of his series is an option for a movie or a TV series, I forget. Very successful writer. You know, he, he knows what he's talking about. But there are also a lot of people who have podcasts and YouTube channels that if you look at their, their actual fiction writing, the thing they're giving advice about, not the nonfiction, which most of them are very successful at, but the fiction they wrote before that it was middling successful. I mean, there's not too many people that are unsuccessful who go into this, but there's a lot of people who are just middling successful at writing fiction, the thing that they're giving advice on, and then they went into nonfiction and hit it big, which is great. But if you're taking their advice, maybe you should know what they did before they started giving advice. I'm not going to name any names because I don't want to. 
piss anybody off. I don't want to call anybody out. I'm just saying, before you take someone's advice, whether it be in the craft of writing or in the business side of writing, you need to look at their success and not their success in their advice books, but their success in the thing they're giving advice on. Um, and then you need to look at when it happened. And you need to ask yourself, they, for instance, in indie publishing, somebody who started in 2010 or 2011 has a much, much better chance of being still being successful now. I mean, a lot of people did fall by the wayside, but if you gained an audience in 2010 and 2011, then and you built it over those years, it's so much easier now to be successful than if you're starting out in 2018 or 2019 after the market's been flooded with indie, indie books. And that, that's, that's indie publishing, obviously. In traditional publishing, if you, you gained an audience back in the, the 90s and are still writing, there's a good chance that you'll still be successful. If you just wrote one book, you know, two years ago or three years ago and it was successful and then you've written a couple more and then successful, that's the, that's the likely scenario. That's most people. I used, you know, I used to think back in, when, in the day when I was trying to get traditionally published that if I got one book published, oh my God, that's it. I've made it. Then, they're, then they'll give me a contract. You know, I'll, I'll be in bookstores. I'll be famous. But the truth is that most people who get Trab published publish one book and that's it because it doesn't do well enough. You know, the Larry Koreas, the, uh, you know, Jim Butchers, they're the, not just the exception to the rule, they're like hen's teeth. They are, you know, a needle in a haystack. Not just an exception, but a unicorn. Because most trad published authors do not make that much money. Even in the um, beginning, when I was indie published, I made more money than, uh, than the majority of trad published authors. Because people, it's, po it's very possible to make a lot of money at it. Look at Brandon Sanderson and... Um, at the aforementioned Larry Correa, Jim Butcher, Laurel K. Hamilton. You can make a lot of money at it. But those people are famous for a reason. Those people are famous because they're the unicorns. They're the great exceptions. So if somebody who got started early is giving you advice on how to be successful, I mean, you need to look and see... Is that advice what got them successful in 1999 or 2000? Or is it something that can get you successful now? Is it something a new writer can use in this day? Because publishing isn't the same as it was in the 90s. Things have changed. Um, not as much money is put into marketing. A lot more, a lot more uh, assumption is made that you as the author are going to help market your book. Or do the majority of it. So you can't assume that just because someone was successful a long time ago means they will be successful now. Or, or that their advice, I sh I, not that they are successful, that, but you can't assume that because they get in their first success a long time ago and have maintained that, that it's going to work for you starting out now. It might. I mean, for instance, Larry, Larry Correa, great guy, very free with advice. He has his own podcast. I highly recommend it. It's called The uh, Author Dojo. And it's a great. It, he gives great advice on that podcast because he keeps an ear to the ground when it comes to publishing. And he's, he's also, you know, very informed with indie publishing. So he gives you good advice, and that's one name I'll just I'll just tell you. You can listen to what he says, and it's good advice. But there's a lot of traditionally published authors out there who their advice would not be good for you for, for business reasons. I mean, look at Stephen King. I mean, he gives he probably gives great um, craft advice, but if he's if he's telling you how to be successful 
as an author in 2022, he may not know. He's Stephen freaking King. He, he writes anything. He puts it out there and it sells. You know, that's, that's not going to work for you. You have to know what it's like to be clawing your way into the pile and, and up to the top so where you can survive in this huge pile of people who are putting, who are submitting works to traditional publishers. In indie, and in indie publishing, it's even worse. I mean, there's no barrier to you getting published in indie publishing. With, and people say, oh, there's no gatekeepers. Well, the gatekeepers is who's going to buy your book and are you going to make any money at it? That's the gatekeeper. The gatekeeper is money, capitalism. So if somebody comes out who was published in 2010 for the first time and was very successful then and has kept writing books the whole time, well, they may have good advice on some things, but if they're telling you how to be a successful writer starting out in 2022, they may or may not know what they're talking about. Maybe they keep maybe they keep informed, maybe they keep their ear to the to the you know ear to the ground and you know keep watching the trends and and maybe they don't maybe they're just trying to cash in on the fact they're successful so you have to check and make sure that the people who are writing this nonfiction or have their podcasts or their courses were they successful in fiction before this and when did they start because if they started a long time ago and their, and their advice hasn't ch changed substantially, then maybe their advice won't work for you anymore. And if they are not that they were not that successful in fiction, it may mean that nonfiction is a way they made money and it doesn't mean it's going to help you. I mean, I have seen I am not I guess I'm not going to name any names, but I have seen people give advice about, Indie publishing, because that's what I started in. Um, and I listen to the people who've taken it, and they think that they are on cloud nine because they've gone from making $5 a month to $100 a month. And they think, oh, well, I'm on an upward trend now, and it's got to continue. No, no. 5 to $100 a month could be a statistical anomaly. It could mean that uh, you caught a trend for one month. And I see people who spend so much more than they've made from it. I see people who spend $5,000 on a book for covers and editing and everything. And they're like, oh, I'm still in the red. I've got three books. I'm still in the red. But I think I'm going to break it. Don't do that. Don't freaking and put $5,000 into a book and assume that you're going to make that back because especially because you've read somebody give you advice that here's what you need to spend for a cover here's what you need to spend for an editor honestly if you can't get if you can't make money with a cheap cover and a cheap editor I don't mean be really successful. But if you can't put that out there and make a you know a few hundred dollars, that book's not going to be successful. You can go back and put that in a better package with a better editor and a better blurb, and it's still not going to be successful. It's still going to make you a few hundred dollars. You're still not going to be in the black. I and people will disagree with me on that, but I I can tell you that the Spending money is not a guarantee of making it back. And listening to advice people give you that this is what you have to spend for an editor and this is what you have to spend for an artist. No, you need the product first. Now, once you have the product, yes, then you spend the money on, and I mean, when I say the product, I mean a successful product, something you know is going to make money. Uh, for instance, if you put out like uh, book one in a series and it doesn't make any money and you and you think it I mean if it, it it's like makes you five dollars a month, 
putting new covers and new blurbs and new editing is not going to take that book from $5 a month to $10,000 a month or, or maybe even $1,000 a month. You might take it to $100 a month. It's not, I'm not trying to say that these aren't important. I want to make that clear. What I'm saying is they're important if you have the product that's going to make money. Um, just blindly putting $5,000 or $3,000 into the packaging of a book because somebody told you this is what you have to do because you took their advice, it's not going to guarantee the book is going to be a success. You need, you need to get an idea of the book's quality before you invest in it. And I think that that's what's left out a lot of this, uh, a lot of this uh, advice you get. Um, it's not, it's maybe not that they are unaware of that, but it, I feel like they don't stress that enough, these people, because they're trying to they're trying not to discourage the people who might buy their uh, courses or go to their conferences or you know subscribe to their podcast or whatever they don't or buy their books they don't want to discourage you from uh, trying their techniques because you know this is how they make their living and that's where I that's where I get worried about advice is people who make their living giving advice as opposed to people who make their living doing the thing they're giving advice about. That's why like I said with shooting you want somebody who made a living you know in law enforcement or military and actually saw combat they're much better at giving you advice than somebody, or even somebody who has competed in defensive shooting sports for a long time is better to get advice from than somebody who started out teaching courses and has never done any of that stuff. And then from there you have to find out, okay, when they teach this course, are they giving you advice that work for them and they don't know why? Or are they giving you advice from other people that they've drawn in who had similar experiences and they've gotten like an aggregate of everything? So if you get advice from somebody in writing, it's, I mean, like I said, you want them to have been successful in the area they're giving advice on, but you also want them to be open to other ideas from people who've also been successful. I have seen so many uh, or listen to so many podcasts where everybody they bring in gives the same advice and i know that's not because they can't find anybody who gives different advice it's because they look for people who have the same experience they do and they'd say oh yeah uh the key to this all was a newsletter or the key to this all was i had to buy new covers or the key to this all was I had to start Facebook marketing. You know, and this is mostly, you know, the, the marketing end of indie publishing, but this is the example I'm using. Um, and they never bring anybody in who had a different experience than that. They bring people, one person after another, who did it exactly this way. And I know there are people who didn't do it that way. I know there are people who aren't doing it that way now. They don't bring them in because they feel like, oh, that's bad advice. You can't duplicate that. Well, the fact is you can't duplicate any of it unless you have other things. There's, there's other variables that come into it. And it's fine to say you, you should get a good cover or you should get a good editor. That's good advice, but it's not guaranteeing that you're going to make money, which is what I see over and over again. It's basically, if you want to make money, you got to do this. I don't see nearly enough people saying, if you want to make money, you have to have a great story that appeals to people on a certain level. And honestly, if you want to just make money, you don't even have to have a great story. You have to have a story that hits the hits the right notes. But if you want to be a 
good writer and make money, well, that's when that's the intersection that, that you're aiming for. And like I said, I don't tell you how to make money because my story is not duplicable. I got into this a certain way that I don't think most people would be able to get into it the way I did. So I don't go around telling people, here's what you need to do to make money. Because I have no idea. I made money, but I also went through it, you know, in a very convoluted and complicated way that probably wouldn't work for most people. And I got started early. That's why I'm not on a show of how to market your science fiction book. I'm not here on a show telling you how to become a best-selling author. I'm, I'm trying to do a craft show. But I, I felt compelled to do this video because I see so many people taking advice, not necessarily bad advice, but taking advice where they're told this is what you have to do to be successful, and it's not. This is something you can do to contribute to your success, to enhance your success, but it's not something that's going to get you the success. Book covers, for example, book cover trends change. You get a quality book covers done in 2018, you get to 2022, that's not the cover that's going to sell anymore. So, and I, and I don't, I see, the, and I see people say that, uh, oh, now you got to get new book covers, but I wonder which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the book cover sell this book, or did this book sell because it was good, and then the people assume it's the cover that did it, and they imitate that cover. And some other book that was good sells with that cover because they imitated that cover. And now people think, oh, this is the cover you have to have. But is it? Is it the cover? As long as the cover catches your eye, you know, gets people to look at the blurb and take a look inside the book, is it the cover, though? Is it the cover that sold that book? Maybe, maybe not. I think that we assume too much that it's the outer trappings that sold the book. Maybe it was. You know, maybe that got somebody to look at it. Maybe it was the blurb. You know, uh, the blurb is very important. And people say, oh, blurb styles change. This blurb doesn't work anymore. Well, does the blurb not work anymore? Or did a lot of people with subpar books start using the exact style of blurb and they aren't selling because their books are subpar, so they assume that blurb isn't working anymore. I don't know. A lot of people think they do know. I'm not sure they do. Um, there's people who make a living telling you what keywords to use for Amazon searches. Is that important? Yeah, yeah, that's important. But is that going to make your book successful? Maybe, maybe not. I feel like there's a lot of variables that go into these things and people are assuming that if they get the right formula, their book will be successful. And they ignore, they ignore that at the heart of it, their book has to be good. Their book has to be well-written. Their book has to be tell a compelling story. And... There's not enough shows out there that will tell you how to tell a compelling story. And they, it's not just, I mean, it's not that they don't know, but maybe they don't know how to tell you. Maybe they don't know how to instruct somebody in that. Maybe it's a lot easier to instruct somebody in how to get the latest cover or how to do the latest blurb or how to market a book on Facebook than it is to tell you how to write a good book. But I am here to tell you all that other stuff is, I don't want to call it window dressing, but it, it is. It's, it's like the, the things around the edges of the issue. And you go for advice to people and you listen to them tell you how to be successful. I, am very, I would be very careful of the people that don't tell you that the first step to being successful is having a well-written book with compelling characters. I mean, people will assume that, but if it was that easy, then everybody would write one. So when you, when you go to people who tell you 
how to write a book and be successful because they are out there and there are much fewer of them far far fewer of them and they will tell you for example you have to hit the tropes and they will say that as if that's a a method of writing a good book is hitting the tropes but that's not true either what hitting the tropes will do for you is maintain your audience because there's people who will who want to read those tropes there's people who want to read you know a certain style of military science fiction that involves you know space marines or space fleet you know and and they'll they will go to one author after another one book after another that has these tropes but if you want to be their favorite author if you want to be the author that they keep coming back to then you can't just count on hitting the tropes you have to make the tropes natural to the book <clears throat> for instance let me talk about drop trooper now i'm not going to say <laughs> i'm not going to make the assumption that i the drop trooper is a great book or that i am a great writer but it's done well and I think one of the reasons it's done well is not just that it hits the tropes, but the way that it hits them. There's a trope in military and science fiction of a down-and-out uh, person who has no other no other way other place to go, going into the Space Marines and going through basic training and meeting a family, a new family in the Marines and obtaining success because of their prowess as a, as a Marine or, or a soldier, depending on if it's Marines or Army in the book. Usually it's Marines, though. It's, it's one of the big things, that Space Marines, that's, that's the trope. Now, Drop Trooper hits every one of those tropes of the succession through the ranks and all that. But it there's a difference between hitting those tropes and... I say adopting those tropes, kind of meshing those tropes into a story you already wanted to tell. Because if you just hit the tropes, if you do, you know, bang, 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 connect the dots, you know, um, paint by number story, you can be successful in the short run. You can get people who will like that series, will read it just because. That's the kind of book they read. But are you going to get people who follow you from one series to another? Are you going to get people who say, oh, he wrote this, so I'm going to go read his, uh, his next series that has nothing to do with this? Because you can get people, if I had written Drop Trooper with Connect the Dots, trope heavy, you know, not worried about characterization, not worried about background and world building, I could have still sold it. It would still make me money. But I get people now who want to follow the world that Drop Troopers in, who want to read all the books that I write. And the reason is I cared about Cameron Alvarez, the main character. I made him somebody I liked and somebody I thought other people would like. I showed the struggles he went through like they happened to a real person. He wasn't just like, I don't know how to put this in a way that's understandable, but if you read something and you've read it a million times before and you've seen it in a million movies, then you know what I'm talking about. You, you have, you've read the same dialogue or heard it in the same dialogue, and it's campy and cliched. And that's not what you want to do. You don't want to be campy and cliched. I mean, like I said, you can, and you'll make some money from that series, but will people follow you to the next series? So when I wrote Drop Trooper, I tried to make the characters as real as possible. I tried to make them feel like a real person would feel. I tried to make the world building compelling enough to draw people in. And that's something that you have to work on from experience, from reading other books, from 
spending time thinking about the world you're building and the characters from practice over and over, writing over writing millions of words, that's not something you can take a shortcut on by listening to advice. That's something you have to do. You have to do the work. It's like in a video game. It's the grind. You have to grind. There is no way around the grind. There's no cheat code you can get by listening to advice that will get you out of the grind of reading lots of science, well, in my case, science fiction, and writing lots of science fiction and getting good at it. You can listen to all this advice and you can listen to marketing advice. You can listen to how to write the book to hit the tropes advice. And maybe you'll make some money at it. But if you want a career at it, my opinion is you can't get away from the grind. You can't get away from doing the work. Um, there is a saying out there that you have to do practice something for 10,000 hours before you get to a, get really good at it. That used to be a thing. My daughter played soccer, competitive soccer, when she was younger. And one of her coaches was very into that. You need 10,000 hours of practice in, in game time before you get really good at soccer, before you're like one of the best. And most people never get that 10,000 hours. Well, it's the same thing in writing. There's no way around that grind. And you can watch these shows and take these courses and go to these conferences and think that this is going to make your book successful, but most people put the cart before the horse when it comes to advice. The advice they're giving is how someone with a really good book can turn it into money. But you don't get to just plop anything down into that formula and make money. You have to have the really good book. And I hope I am helping some people improve the quality of their book, but even the advice I give, it's worthless if you don't put in the grind. And I hope that's one piece of advice I can give that people will listen to, is that there is no getting around that. There is no getting around the work you have to do. Work that's not going to give you money for the most part. Sometimes it may. Like I said, if you package something well, you can make some money at it. But if you really want to make be successful at this, the, you want to be one of the very, very, very few people who can make a living at it. There's no getting around the grind. And I think that the people who are willing to put in that grind are the people who love what they're doing. So even if you don't make enough money to live off of it, even if you just have a couple successful series, I think that if you put that work in, that means you love it enough that you'll do it anyway. And I love it enough that I do it anyway. I probably wouldn't work as hard as I do and as many hours a day as I do at it if I wasn't doing this for a living. But I sure would keep doing it. And I've heard that advice given a bunch of places that... Uh, that you have to judge success as, you know, something other than making money. You know, that I, I'm not sure if I agree with that. Now, if I had not made money at this, if I had not, if I did not have an audience, if I did not, was not able to pay my bills by doing this, would I think that I had been a success? I don't know. For instance, I spend lots of money on wildlife photography. I'm not ever going to make that a living on that. I do it because I love doing it. And I don't think of myself as a success or failure in wildlife photography because it's something I love doing. That's why I think that uh, the idea of being a success or failure at writing, well, whether you make money, I don't think you need to think of it that way if, unless you intend to make money. If you are in this to make a living, then yes, you will succeed or fail at that. And I don't think that you need to adjust the definition of success to something like, oh, if I affected one person's life, then I'm a success. No, if that's what you're in it for, then 
Why are you thinking of them in terms of success or failure? If you're in this just to get your books read and just to affect one person's life, it's a passion. It's a hobby. And there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Like I said, I spend lots of money and time on photography and never make any money at it. I don't think I'm a failure at photography because I don't make money at it. Make money at it. It's not something I succeed or fail at. It's something that I feel I get better at and have fun with, and it's it's more like uh, being an artist. And if you're in writing to be an artist, then there's no success or failure. Why are you Why are you thinking of success or failure? That's the problem I have with that advice. Oh, you need to redefine success. No, you need to not think about success. If you are in this because you love writing then why are you thinking about success or failure? Think about it as, this is what I love to do, so I'm just going to get better at it. There is no success or failure at that. It's just a progression. You know, you keep if you keep getting better, you're, you're and you keep loving what you're doing, where's the success or failure? You're succeeding by having fun at it. Um, but if you want to think in terms of success or failure, if you want to do this as a business, then yeah, succeeding means making money. There is no other definition of it. Because if you were changing the definition to something else, then you're not in this for the money, and you don't need to think about it that way. It's, there's no, there's no uh, binary definition of success or failure if you're not in this as a business. If this isn't your job, then why are you thinking about success or failure? It's like thinking, uh, I'm, I'm a success or failure at weightlifting. I do it because I want to do it. There's no success or failure at it. Uh, I just do it to keep in shape. You know, I do it because I like doing it. I'm a success or failure at uh, at hiking. You know, I love I love hiking, or or if you love camping, I don't really like backpacking, but some people do. If you love backpacking, you're not a success or failure at it. You do it because you love it. So I think that the advice I've seen recently about defining success as a writer. It's nonsense. If you're not in it for the money, then there, then you shouldn't be thinking of it that way. And if you are in it for the money, then it's very it's very simple. If you make enough money, you know, to either live on or or to pay the debts that you wanted to pay, then you're a success. And if you can't sell your books, then yeah, you're a failure. You know, that doesn't mean you'll always be a failure. If you want to keep at it and become successful at it you you can but that's that's the problem a lot of people have is they're not sure what they want to be they listen to advice on how to become a success financially and it doesn't work and then they have to redefine what success is but if you just write cuz you love it there's nothing wrong with that don't listen to these people who give advice and say you know well you can be successful by doing that no just do it. Just write. Don't worry about all that crap. If you uh, and if you are serious about the business of being a writer, well then then you're going to have to live with the fact that you've been you, you know you you've made money or you haven't. <laughs> it's not it's not uh, it's reality. I mean, and that's the problem. A lot of writers are artistic types, and artistic types are sensitive people. And they don't like to deal with the cold, harsh reality. That's why, we, that's why we write. That's why we go into fiction. But reality is, either you, either you made money or you didn't. Either you can make a living off it or you can't. And if you can't, you know, well, then you need to do something else. It's not. There's no shame in 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 making a living at something else. If you love writing, keep writing. But don't think of it as a business. Because. Thinking of something as a business and then not succeeding at it is the best way I can think of to lose your love for it. So if you love writing and you've given it a go and you can't make money at it, keep writing. Keep putting it out there if you want. But don't consider it a business. Don't consider it uh, even a side gig. Just think of it as a hobby, as a, as a passion. Write as a passion, and eventually, if you write as a passion, you'll come up with something people love. It may take a long time, but you will. And that's the grind. That's you know, you keep writing, you keep getting better at it. You know, 
Eventually, you will be good enough that somebody's going to notice. You may have given up on it by then, but I would advise you if, if you're in that position where you haven't made money, but you want to keep writing, keep putting it out there. Don't spend a lot of money. I mean, you can. I spend a lot of money on stuff that I don't make any money off of. And if that's something you want to do, spend the money, but don't ever expect to get it back. Think of it as, you know, an investment not for money, but investment in something you love. You know, it's like a, a passion for you. Spend that money to give it the best cover you think you can afford. Don't go overboard. Don't expect to get that money back. And eventually, you'll get something that people will love. I mean, you may be able to follow that up. You may not. But, you know, it, eventually that'll pay off. But if you love writing, don't give it up and keep doing it. But don't try to make it a business unless you are willing to put the grind in to get good at it. And don't assume that if, if you follow the advice that people give you, that it's going to be successful no matter the quality of the work. Okay, I've gotten kind of far afield there, but that's something that I'm kind of passionate about is I, I see this a lot. I mean, I talk to a lot of writers. I mean, it's in... in when you get in the business, you talk to so many people and so many people more successful and less successful and financially and the people that want to be successful financially. And it's frustrating because a lot of times you can't tell them this stuff. That's one another reason I do this YouTube channel. Is I can tell, pe tell people things in general that I would feel guilty telling individuals face-to-face -face or on a a chat on the internet or somewhere because you don't want to hurt people's feelings. But they look they they look at these these podcasts and, and YouTube channels and go to these conferences and they think that the problem is they haven't found the right one yet. But the real problem is they don't have the product to package. And listening to people's advice who tell them the secret is the secret is this or the secret the secret is your newsletter, the secret is your advertising, the secret is your covers. It gets frustrating because people put all their money and time and effort into this and they don't want to go through the grind, the grind that is necessary. They don't want to They don't want to um, write one book after another that isn't successful and may not be that great until they get to the point where they've perfected their art. And I am afraid there's no way around that. And if you think that's bad advice, well, it's worth every penny you paid for it. <laughs> uh, that's why I do this free. Because if people get mad about the advice I give... You know, they, they can't say, well, I, I'm not going to buy his book anymore on, on, on nonfiction because I don't have one. I'm trying to tell you the truth that I have found in this business over the last 10 years, 11 years. And I hope that it can help you out. And I hope it doesn't discourage you. Because that's what I'm trying to say. You take this advice and it doesn't work, you get discouraged. You think that that you've listened to the wrong advice or you've gone the wrong way, that you haven't been successful. But the fact is, you just have to keep working. And if you don't want to do this as a business, then stop listening to these shows. Stop buying these books. Stop going to these conferences because all it's going to do is discourage you. If you don't want to do this as a business, then keep writing and stop worrying about making money at it. If you never make money at it and you have fun, then you've accomplished your goal. You know, you there's no there's no success or failure to that. You've made you've had fun, you've gotten the stories out there you wanted to get out, and maybe someday people will love them. Maybe someday they'll get discovered, and maybe they won't. 
Maybe you'll just write stuff that makes you happy. And I see people who write and they're like, oh, this was unsuccessful or I couldn't sell it and now I'm such a failure. No, no, you're not. You wrote something. You, you wrote something you loved. You told a story you wanted to tell. Why does that have to be success or failure? That's just having fun. Stop trying, to, stop trying to think of yourself as something you're not. Stop trying to make writing not fun by making it into a business. If you can make a business of it, that's great. That's awesome. Very few people can. Very few. So don't think that that makes you a, a bad person or a lazy person or makes you unlucky just do the job that you do and do the hobbies you love. And think of writing that way. It was writing was more fun when I didn't do it as a business. You know? So don't don't think that that's a bad thing. Don't think that the fact that you can't make money at it is a bad thing. Stop listening to people who tell you how to make money at it if you don't think that that's what you want to do for a business. Cuz I'm telling you you will have less fun at it if you start treating it like a business. So it maybe you should just write and do it for the love of it. If, if you are listening to all these podcasts and conferences and still can't make money at it, don't try. That's my advice. Don't try. If, you can't, if you've done this for a year and you're, you've gone from $5 a month to $100 a month and you can't make any more... Stop looking for the advice, the perfect advice that's going to get you to the point where you make a couple of thousand a month and just write because you love doing. That's another piece of advice that may not be popular, but that's my that's what I think. You know. So if you are going to do this as a business, be very careful of the advice you listen to. Be be careful of people who think that the advice they give is the key to success as opposed to painting around the edges because the core of it is still writing a compelling story. And if you do take people's advice, remember that they are taking it as a given that you've already written a compelling story. Because that's the thing that... Uh, all this stuff is is meant to help is a, a compelling story with compelling characters that draws people in and all this other stuff can help you make a little more money at that if you have the compelling story so don't uh, don't take their advice as the key to success their advice is helpers along the way to success and Honestly, don't take my advice as gospel either. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe maybe everything I've said is from a point of view influenced by how I got here. But I can tell you that I've seen lots and lots of people come into this business over the last 11 years, 12 years and have a brief run of success and then get out. I kept writing and I kept at it. And I don't know that I'm going to stay this successful. It might, everything might change. I might not be in this house a year from now if things go to crap, but I feel like just having written the things I've written and having the chance to make a living at it has been like a real blessing, and I don't want to let that go without trying to help you understand the way I got here. So if my advice doesn't work for you, feel free to toss it aside. But take one piece of it, and that is be careful of who you listen to advice from. Don't reject what they say, but and don't think they're a bad person for what they've said. Because they may honestly believe it works, just like I honestly believe what I tell you is the, is the truth. But all of us are writing it and, and recording it and teaching it from the subjective point of view 
of what worked for us. So, anyway, I've rambled on long enough about this, um, and I hope to be back with another video in another few weeks, and I will uh, talk to you guys next time.